OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashish. Good morning, or afternoon. Um, good morning. Uh, I have about 20 minutes to tell you about this free software project I work on called Sandstorm. Um, so uh, I'll be very happy to answer questions uh, in the Q&A, and also just outside of this room afterwards, since probably there will be more than five minutes of questions, because Sandstorm is kind of weird. If you do ask me a question, I'm, or you just want a sticker, I'm very happy to give you a sticker. So I hope you do uh, come ask me questions. So uh, I said in the description that Sandstorm is a web, app, a web native package manager, I think. Uh, I can explain how it is a package manager. But let me first explain what it looks like to a user. And to a user, it is a free software alternative to Google Docs. So if that's something you want or something that people you know want, then maybe you should look into Sandstorm. And I've actually stopped making new Google Docs to collaborate with people. I make them on Sandstorm. And to just show you what that's like, we'll do a demo. Uh, hopefully, this demo will work. So that's always the, the trick. Great. So uh, Sandstorm runs this server. This, so I should say Sandstorm is the software, but it's also the name of the company that I work for. There are seven of us. So uh, Sandstorm Development Group Incorporated runs a server called demo.sandstorm.io. Uh, in the next 60 seconds, I'm going to make a new collaborative tech document using Etherpad. So if I had a normal Sandstorm server, I could log in. But since I, I'm just using the demo, I'll click Start the Demo. And I'll uh, see, I'll install an app. Will I? OK, sure, why not? Uh, so I'll install Etherpad, although there's other things I could install. Uh, so get on the DevConf IRC channel. Uh, there'll be a surprise in a second. Uh, now I can make a new Etherpad document. And it'll spin up an Etherpad instance for me with a collaborative document. So, you know. Great. So uh, now, since I said it's like Google Docs, I'll make a sharing link. So I'll click on the, let me just zoom out. Uh, I'll click on this hamburger thing, click share, and I'll make a shareable link. And here's the fun part, drop it on IRC. So I look forward to seeing you all on this pad over the next couple of seconds. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it, uh, I'll leave it like this for about 30 seconds while you all deface my pad. And then after that, I will revoke your access. So, great. Um, yeah, so like I said, it's a free software alternative to Google Docs. Uh, here we have a, round, a Sandstorm package, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> an Etherpad package. Um. <laughs> Ooh, nice snowman. Wow. Wow. OK, well, that's about 30 seconds. So uh, I can also revoke that sharing link. So now you're all gone. <laughs> Great. Uh, so that's what Sandstorm is like for users. Uh, by the way, uh, does anyone have a, can anyone show the audience what it looks like when, you revoked, when I revoked your sharing link? Yeah, it's just immediate emptiness. Yes. Oh, snap. Oh, snap. Sorry, DKG. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's really, it really is just multi multiplayer, real-time gopher. So yeah, uh, that was the demo. Um, so that's what Sandstorm is like for users. Uh, but I want to tell you why we're working on this project. So software as a service is the main competition to free software web applications. Software as a service is actually a competitor to software. So uh, I'm going to paint some bleak pictures for you about the software as a service landscape where people just run things without having any control over it. So here's sort of how popular one service is. I'll just let this sink in for a second. And if you think this is bad, then you might want to know more about Google Docs. Here's their growth over time recently. So there's about a quarter of a billion people using Google Docs on a monthly basis. This is actually the monthly active users, not even the people who've created an account. That's probably more people than have ever heard of free software is almost definitely more people than have ever used Debian. So software as a service is very popular and is basically out-competing software. And 
it's really nice in some ways. You can go to the Google Docs website, you can click, you can uh, start using stuff, you don't have to install something, you don't have to manage upgrades, somebody else manages that, somebody else manages security. The only problem is there's no software freedom. So users have no control. And I'm gonna tell you about Sandstorm and how it works, and I hope you understand that I'm very impassioned about Sandstorm because I think it addresses the free software needs of people who are using servers controlled by other people. Uh, of course, there's probably lots of other great approaches too, and I'm happy to hear about them either in the Q&A or after the talk. So a brief table of contents then for this presentation. You've already seen how Sandstorm is an alternative to Google Docs. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little more about how it brings software freedom to users of web apps. And I like to say Sandstorm looks like a usability project, but is secretly a security project. And uh, I'll show you a bit about how our packaging works in Sandstorm for taking Linux server apps and making them something you can run in Sandstorm. And I'll talk to you about some uh, similarities and differences between Debian and Sandstorm. So let me begin with software freedom. So software freedom is the idea that people can use, modify, and share the software they use. And uh, in Debian, of course, we commit to this with the Debian free software guidelines. It works great on my laptop. It works great for me on my server. Um, but a bit of a sad story about Gatorius. So how many of you know about Gatorius? I presume everyone in the room. Uh, so Gatorius was a free software alternative to GitHub. This is what it looked like. It actually just shut down because they stopped running it. Um, the main instance at Gatorius.org. Of course, it's AGPLv3 software, so you can run it yourself if you want to. Anyway, four years ago, I was an active user of Gatorius, and I really wanted this feature called webhooks, which is like git post receive hooks, but they send messages over HTTP to you uh, when some event occurs. And it turns out that I read the documentation and webhooks were already part of Gatorius. And then I kept reading the documentation and it said, this is disabled on the main instance, but you can use this on your self-install. And so as a user, I want to modify Gatorius.org that I'm using on a daily basis by submitting them a one-line patch to their config file. But I can't do that, or I can do it maybe, but if I will, they won't accept it. This is not software freedom. This is not the ability to modify the software I'm using. And a lot of what we do in the free software world when we see centralized web services is we build what I would call free of cost and free software, software as a service web applications. And these are things like tiny, 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 tiny RSS, WordPress, uh, Gatorius, and with those tools, we empower the sysadmins to use and modify the software but the end users of the software have no freedom to modify it. There's sort of a quick mental rule you can go to in your head. If a thing is multi-user, then probably most of the users have effectively no software freedom. They cannot modify it. So this, the tragedy of no software freedom isn't just this hypothetical that people don't have the experience of being able to change their software. It has a real practical application in that people modify software in order to make it do what they want. And user creativity is a lot of what drives free software forward. And so a service like Gatorius won't gather contributors in the same way as something that people could modify on their own laptops, because if you make a small change to Gatorius that makes sense for you, that doesn't make sense for some other user, there, you have no way to use that on the Gatorius central service. So I think that free of cost or free software, SaaS apps, empower sysadmins, but they don't empower users. But they, act they actively harm users in a lot of cases, too. So here's some brief stats of security issues in a few free software web apps that I found for this talk. If you use Roundcube, or you use WordPress, or you use Etherpad, you need to update it frequently, or your so-called private data running on your server can be exploited and abused by others. And the one thing that software as a service provides is this maintenance. Uh, you know, you might think, this is not a big deal. If these things are packaged in Debian, they can upgrade them. Uh, if they're packaged some other way, it's free software, they can maintain their own servers. But the truth is people don't maintain their own servers. So Etherpad in March wrote a blog post about how, hey, everyone, if you have an Etherpad install, you have to upgrade. Here's a list of free, of cost, installs of our free software that people need to upgrade. And if you look at this list, pad.mozilla.org, etherpad.mozilla.org is down in this list. The Wikimedia the Etherpad is there. Uh, La Quadrature du Net pad is there. These are pads running free software 
that is remotely exploitable to defeat user privacy. And Mozilla and, e and Wikimedia have all the resources in the world they need to get around to upgrading their pads. If they can't upgrade their free web software, realistically, no one can. So that's the sort of sad truth, I think, of free software as a service web applications. Uh, let me tell you a bit of a happier a bit of a happier perspective. On my own laptop, I can do things like download tarballs and configure them to run in my home directory. And this is sort of the world that we're used to, where people can, uh, on their own computers, modify the software they're using. And when you do that, you end up maybe with personal patches. Maybe I patched, like literally, I once patched also Mixer to say Salsa Mixer. This is not something that I could do if also Mixer were a remote web application. It's not even necessarily useful, but it was a fun thing to do. Uh, the other thing is that these patches are private by default in my own machine. It's not like modifying the software affects it for everyone else. It's that it's that, that makes it so hard. And uh, people in sort of the proprietary web app world talk a lot about data portability. In Debian, we know how to do data portability. It's called tar. You make a backup. And if you want to move from one Debian machine to another Debian machine, you tar up your home and you move. And that's sort of the whole story. Uh, but if I have get install WordPress, literally I have get install WordPress from the archive, and I make a WordPress blog that, uh, and I let Noodles, let's say, have access to a new WordPress blog he creates using my server, Noodles has nothing like tar to back up the state of that WordPress and move it to his own app get installed WordPress. So the state of the art in Debian web app packaging is worse than the state of the art in command line tools. Uh, so actually, I'll take a second now and show you how Sandstorm handles that portability issue. So on this pad here, uh, I have a mouse suite. Uh, every Sandstorm package has this backup feature provided by Sandstorm. If I click this, it gives me a zip file of the contents of that, uh, of that app state. And I can restore that. Ooh, live demos. And I can restore that. Great. Uh, here, oh, wrong button. Here, great. And there we go. Sorry? Well, <laughs> yeah, okay. So this is, this is me having restored the state of that etherpad, having downloaded a backup. Um, this works in Sandstorm because the promise between Sandstorm and apps is that the app owns its own little slash var, and so the download is the download of the current state of slash var for that app, uh, which is kind of like tarring up a home directory. So, um, right. So Sandstorm, I like to say, looks like a usability project and is secretly a security project. Um, so there's a few ways in which this is true. One is that access control is managed by Sandstorm. So when I gave you that Etherpad link, uh, your permission to use that pad hinged on Sandstorm granting that access. And it has the upside of giving universal Google Docs style sharing to app instances. And it also has the upside of insulating you from bugs in access control by apps. Uh, so we also emphasize granularity, the idea that one document should be security isolated from another document. So in the Etherpad case, Clicking new Etherpad document spins up an entire new Etherpad install configured to just have one document in it. And so each thing in my sort of Google Docs files view is a whole separate install of Etherpad. Uh, if Etherpad were malicious or if it were buggy, somebody might want to take the private data in my pad and export it out to the internet. That's a kind of serious problem that could occur. Uh, but in Sandstorm, we sandbox apps so they have no network access. So the goal here is to be able to run arbitrarily insecure web apps safely. So therefore, we can't let, allow them to have network access by default. Uh, there's another thing that we're doing kind of differently called the power box. So it's, best, it's easier to explain that with an example from GNOME. So in GNOME, if you do file open or something, you might see a file chooser dialog like this. Uh, the funny thing about this file chooser dialog is that it returns a string to the app, and then the app opens that string. But it, the app could have opened any of these files. It's just being nice to you by asking. Uh, it would be a better design, which the GNOME team is working on, to have this dialog grant a single file descriptor to the app. And then the app would only have access to the resources it needs, and the user would have had a chance to choose what it would look at. 
Uh, this in the security world is called the Powerbox approach, so we call the Powerbox 2, and we're using that for uh, inter-app communication as well as file system stuff. So we have a few other techniques. Oh, I should emphasize the Powerbox is not fully implemented yet in Sandstorm. It's like half vaporware, we'll get there. You don't have to believe me, check back in a year. Um, but uh, there's a few other techniques that we're using for security hardening apps. One is uh, that use only logged in users that the user has granted access to use this app instance should be able to do that. So this maybe blends weirdly with WordPress, where you want the whole world to read your blog. So with WordPress, we literally wget recursive the blog and publish it as static HTML, and Sandstorm serves that static HTML, not WordPress. So there's no attack surface to WordPress anymore for logged out users. Uh, we also do a bunch of tricks to like content security policy to try to constrain in the browser how data can flow. Uh, and we use seccomp and we don't mount slash proc and slash sys to limit how much of the kernel's attack surface a process can interact with. And the results are that all those five Etherpad issues from this year don't affect Etherpad and Sandstorm. And there's actually two, at least two, Linux privilege escalation vulnerabilities that if your kernel is vulnerable to, apps in Sandstorm can't exploit it because they require access to these obscure syscalls, which most web apps don't need, so we've blocked them before. Uh, so just a, a sort of almost flame bait question. If you have a sandbox as aggressive as this, do you really need to upgrade very often? Do we really need to worry that much about embedded code copies if the code can't do that much damage? I think the answer is no. We don't need to worry about it as much. So uh, that's how Sandstorm is secretly a security project. And you need this kind of hardening if you're going to build something like Google Docs by packaging the whole world of free web app software with all of its constant change and possible vulnerabilities. Uh, but So let me tell you more about how to make a Sandstorm package. I have only a few minutes, so I might breeze through this. Uh, feel free to ask me more questions afterwards. So for packaging, there's three steps. You first create a file that's basically Debian control that we call Sandstorm package def .capnp. Uh, you do that by running this command spk init along with the name of the program, the argv you need to actually start your web app process. Uh, that'll create this sandstorm package def capnp file. Uh, the next thing that sandstorm, sandstorm, once it has that, needs to know what files on your system to slurp up into a package file. And that list of files is called the sandstorm files list. Uh, to generate that, the way that we do this right now is you interact with the app in dev mode, you type spk dev, and it launches in a Sandstorm install on your laptop, and you click around, and when you control C that, Sandstorm makes a list of all the files that the process touched, read from, that is, and makes that your Sandstorm files.list. And then whatever files those were, were, they get slurped into a Sandstorm package called the spk file. So it's, that's pretty ad hoc and non-declarative, and I'd like to improve that, but that's the way it works right now. Uh, you do that with this tool called spk pack. Uh, the nice thing is that your dependent, the, the, the quote unquote nice thing is that your dependencies don't have to be packaged then. Um, so, interactions between Debian and Sandstorm. There's a few, I think, interesting crossover points. Uh, technically, it's worth knowing that every Sandstorm package is a Debian derived distro. So, maybe I should go to the planning boss for uh, derivatives. Um, but each app developer actually in Sandstorm would have to go to the planning boss. So, that's kind of odd. Um, at the moment, we only support one CPU architecture, which is AMD64. Um, that's sort of because the app packages are binary packages at the moment. Um, there's this other thing that Sandstorm Development Group, the company, does for the Sandstorm user base, which is we're running services for Sandstorm users. The most clear one is we run this dynamic DNS service called sandcats.io. Uh, I'm working on other features other than dynamic DNS there. I'm negotiating with some cert certificate authorities to see if I can give out free HTTPS certificates. Um, like making, running services to help the community run their servers is not something that the Debian world does, but it might be something worth looking into. Uh, so in Debian, um, oh, and, and we're also using the um, official Debian Vagrant box. So is Antonio Tercero in the room? OK, well, anyway, there's a couple of Debian developers who make the Debian Vagrant box, so thank you for doing that work. 
Um, one of the great things about Debian is that when I wanted to make the Alpine package on my laptop so that I could upgrade to the next version of Alpine easily, the obvious way to do that was for me to make, sorry, when I wanted to install Alpine when it was new, when the first beta release came out, 0 0.80, and then I wanted to be able to upgrade to 0 0.81 when it came out, my thinking was the easiest way to do that would be to upgrade using a deb file. So I made a deb, and then it wasn't a huge delta to share that deb with the world. And that's the sense in which Debian has been really good about aligning the incentives for people to share the software they're packaging for themselves or for other people. Uh, similarly, in Sandstorm, in order to run an app at all on your Sandstorm server, you need to make a package. So we hope that many people will share those packages as they make them. Uh, one Debian-ish thing that we found community-wise is that we were hoping that upstream web app authors would care a lot about Sandstorm and make Sandstorm packages. But in truth, it's the Sandstorm community, kind of like in Debian, that does the packaging work because the upstreams can already run their software. They don't need us. Um, there's this other uh, difference, maybe, in the way the Debian structures community versus Sandstorm, which is that we really emphasize getting more users as the main purpose of our community building. So I want to actually show you our Get Involved page because it's sort of just strange for a free software project. It says, hi there. You know, it says nice things. That, that part is not the strange thing. It says, first of all, join our mailing list, join the chat room, ask questions, give a talk about Sandstorm, package a new Sandstorm app. Oh, yeah, and I guess if you want to contribute to the code, here's the GitHub link. Uh, and the reason it has that structure is that the thing that we need the most from the community is more people using Sandstorm and more people talking about it. And maybe this is true for Debian, too. Uh, our Get Involved pages maybe should de-emphasize how to make a package for Debian or contribute to Debian, uh, the core of Debian, and rather get people understanding how to tell other people to use Debian, and then we'd have more users. Right. Uh, how many of these do I have? Okay, great. Uh, cool. So uh, I have only about 30 seconds left in this presentation, and I want to just leave you with a few next steps. One is that I'm setting up storm.debian.net. Uh, I think you can go there right now, uh, but you'll get a splash page that says I haven't set up the server yet. I, I'm hoping to have this service be a Google Docs alternative that Debian people can use. And if you want to co-maintain this with me, I would love to talk with possible co-maintainers of that service. Um, the other thing to say, that to close with, if you're building a free software web app and the users of your app do not control the code they're running, what exactly is the freedom that you're providing to your users? So thanks. Uh, I'm happy to have Q&A here, and we can do more Q&A out in the hallway, too. So thanks. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Was that just like, perfect, you'll all use it now. Uh, I'll ask a question. Um, oh. What of the sandboxing type stuff that you've built, which sounds pretty cool, do you think is possible to put back into Debian? Um, so the one, uh, here's a few of them. Um, Deb w Debian web app, web app packages should follow the inspiration of this, which is they should install IP tables rules by default that prevent the user ID of that web app from having network access. Um, uh, we have a blacklist of syscalls in our set comp filter list that it would be pretty straightforward to make a tiny sandboxing tool to use that uh, blacklist. Um, there's some content security policy type stuff that's harder to get web apps to do if you don't have a proxy in the middle. So that's sort of the shape of it. Okay, thanks.